Welcome to the Electric Wire podcast. We bring you news and views on the most pressing issues facing Wisconsin's electric industry from policymakers, executives, and customer and environmental advocates. Bringing you these discussions, we are the Customers First Coalition. Here's your host, Executive Director Kristen Jilks. Welcome to this special episode of the Electric Wire podcast. I am Kristen Jilks, the Executive Director of the Customers First Coalition. And on April 13th, the Customers First Coalition hosted a power breakfast in Madison, Wisconsin, discussing the role of nuclear power in Wisconsin's energy generation mix. Our event was recorded by Wisconsin Eye, and you can find both audio and video of the Power Breakfast at Wisconsin Eye's website, wiseye.org, W-I-S-E-Y-E dot org. Thank you again to Wisconsin Eye for providing the audio for this podcast. So what we are doing here is we are rebroadcasting the Power Breakfast. I've split it up into two portions. So part one will be the first half of the breakfast and the following podcast episode will feature the last half of the Power Breakfast, which was our industry perspectives panel. I want to say a huge thank you to our event sponsors, Our energy density sponsors were Fredrickson and Byron Law Firm, LLP, with an office here in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, Thank you to the Nuclear Energy Institute for also being an energy density sponsor. Our All the Power sponsors are the Wisconsin Counties Association, New Scale Power, and Stafford and Rosenbaum, LLP. Our Baseload Generation sponsors are Michael Best, Wisconsin Utilities Association, ATC, and the Natural Resource Development Association. So thank you again to all of our sponsors. And in this episode, part one, you will hear first from Jennifer Schilling, who served as the event MC. Jennifer will introduce first Senator Melissa Agard, who is the minority leader in the Wisconsin State Senate. Melissa was followed by Representative Kevin Peterson, who is the Speaker Pro Tempore of the Wisconsin State Assembly. Next, you will hear a federal perspective from Cheryl Moss Herman, who is a senior advisor at the Department of Energy. And finally, this episode will conclude with remarks from Christine Chismedia, who is the senior director of state outreach at the Nuclear Energy Institute. Thank you again to all of our speakers and all of our sponsors. Thank you again to Wisconsin Eye. I'll turn you over to Jen Schilling now. Thank you, Kristen. Um, it is fantastic to see so many familiar faces and be back here. And we just we can't have this kind of networking and a fantastic breakfast through Zoom. So it is great to uh, all of us that we can join back together. And um, want to recognize and thank very much uh, those that are serving the food to us today here at the Park Hotel. And so a round of applause, I think, for those that are bringing us that breakfast. Well, it is an honor to introduce our first speaker today. She is a good friend and really a pragmatic leader, and I am very proud of the role that she has assumed in the state Senate. Senator Melissa Agard uh, serves as the minority leader in the, West- in the Wisconsin State Senate and has represented the north side of Madison on the, uh, and on the, D- on the Dane County Board and in the legislature for over a decade. So public service runs deep for Melissa. She was first elected to the State Assembly in 2012, where she served four terms, and she was then elected to the State Senate in 2020 and was elected Minority Leader in November of 2022. So similar to a a two-year presence in the State Senate and then becoming the leader, there is a lot to learn where you're standing in front of the fire hydrant where it's wide open trying to get a drink of water, but she is doing a great job. She brings with her years of experience on the Assembly Energy and Utilities Committee. So thank you for your service, uh, Senator Agard, and thank you for joining us today. I was just going to thank you as Senator Schilling, but thank you, Jennifer. (laughs) 
Um, and thank you very much to Kristen for reaching out and inviting me to be here today. Um, I am really excited about the conversations that are going to be taking place in this room and the diversity of folks that are here. Um, it's really amazing. I am Melissa Agard. I am the senator for the 16th Senate District, the leader of the Senate Democrats across the street, and uh, a lifetime Wisconsinite. I'm a mom of four, and I care deeply about protecting and preserving our natural resources, our way of life in our state, not only for my kids, but for future children who are not here at this point in time. And I think ultimately that is a goal that we all share. One of the things that I have learned um, in my time in the legislature is it's vitally important that we figure out what it is that we agree on and where it is that we want to go. I know we have all very different perspectives on how it is that we want to get to that point, but if we can make an agreement about where it is that our end point is, I think that we're going to be a lot more successful. And I see that happening in this room uh, with these people, and I really appreciate the work of Customers First convening conversations like this. Um, so I do um, appreciate everything that you all do and the sacrifice that you have made in order to be here today um, at this breakfast hosted by Customers First. Um, the work that we all do together frankly, is invaluable. And the work that is done across the street by us as legislators cannot be done without our partnership with every single one of you. At the end of the day, the people of the great state of Wisconsin are our bosses, and it's vitally important that we listen earnestly to you in order to solve the big problems that we have in our state and prevent bigger problems from occurring. I want to dig in a little bit today about what is included in the state budget that was proposed by Governor Evers, um, highlighting our need to diversify energy in the state of Wisconsin and the priorities that he has lifted up. Uh, it's clear that these policies have been put forward um, not in a silo, but because of conversations with people like all of you. And before I um, dive into this list, I think it is also important that you all realize that our doors are open. So there's a number of us here today that are legislators in the Capitol building, and we actually get really excited when you reach out to us um, and you share your knowledge, your experience, um, and your visions. Uh, I think that you know there is a narrative that we're busy. Uh, people always are apologizing before they reach out to me, um, before we sit down and have our conversations. I'm so busy. I'm so sorry that we're taking this time. Don't apologize. That is our job um, to be able to make time to hear directly from you. Um, we know uh, whether it's at the local level, um, which I've had the opportunity of, to serve, or at the state level, and even our partners at the federal level, that it's really about having trusting, healthy relationships, and that's how it is that we move our state forward. Um, so that said, we do realize that um, climate change is an intimate threat to our state and our nation, our economy, and our children's future. And I know that we all want to be sure that we have fresh air to breathe, that we have clean water to drink, and healthy land to grow our food on. Um, and frankly, if any of you are um, fishers getting ready for trout season to open up, the fact that you can... Um, not only catch those fish, but harvest them and eat them in a safe manner. It's something that I look forward to doing every year with my kids. Um, climate change is here. Um, there is no denying that. And we know that we want to have a strong environment for our families now, and like I said, for future families that are coming up behind us. And we need to be intentional with the policies that we move forward um, as, as legislators, but also as advocates for people who love our, our state and want to make sure that we're doing everything that we can. We know in Wisconsin that we care deeply about our environment. Uh, we started Earth Day here in the great state of Wisconsin, right? That's, that's coming up uh, in about a week. And uh, there is clearly more that we can and should be doing. Uh, diversifying our energy source is one of those things. Uh, we need to be making the transition to clean, carbon-free energy now. We don't need to be waiting um, for later. One of the earliest memories, I think maybe my very first committee meeting was an energy and utilities meeting um, after I was first elected to the um, Assembly. And it was a joint meeting with the Senate, and we had members of the environmental groups, the um, 
utilities and the PSC all coming before and educating us as legislators. Um, and I will say that I was really heartened by the conversations that were being had in that room, especially by folks that work for the utilities on the fact that we need to be responsive to the needs of the people within the state of Wisconsin. People are wanting more green and renewable energy. They're willing to pay a little bit more to make sure that we are investing in that. And that, that message is heard. Um, we all want to know that the water uh, is warm when we get in the shower in the morning and that after a, a long day at work, we can go home and if it's summer, the air conditioning works or the heat works, right? We don't want to have to struggle with those things. Um, but we also want to know um, that we're not... Um, making our environment be less safe um, or not going to be here for future generations. And clearly, we can be working on that together. So we know that nuclear energy is a significant part of this formula, not only in Wisconsin, but across our nation. And in fact, here in Wisconsin, accounts for about 15% of the state's electricity on an annual basis. I know that both Governor Evers and President Biden have championed a thoughtful and sustainable transition to clean energy and have provided sensible solutions to climate change, rising costs, and job creation. This is something that we need to be thinking about as well. In 2019, Governor Evers created the Governor's Task Force on Climate Change, and through this task force, there were people brought together, a diverse coalition of people brought together, farmers, environmental advocates, indigenous leaders, business executives representing diverse perspectives, local members of our communities and industries. And these people worked in a collaborative and really positive way, uniting around a shared goal to ensure that Wisconsin is cleaner and safer and more equitable today and into our future. The report that was released by this group contained 55 climate solutions across nine different sectors that laid out a foundation for our state, for Wisconsin to be better to adapt to and to mitigate the effects of climate change, while also ensuring that we're seeking environmental justice, economic opportunities, and renewable energy, as well as conservation here in our great state. Some of the solutions for this report included creating a state office to address climate injustices, developing job training programs for displaced and marginalized workers, fund assistance to help farmers adapt to more sustainable um, practices, implementing transportation policies that promote clean energy, alternative methods in transportation. I know my 20-year-old uh, my kids love multimodal transportation and would like to see more of that. They're not super excited to get behind the wheel of a car in the way previous generations have wanted to and um, making statutory changes to help the energy sector transition to cleaner energy production. So Governor Evers has clearly created an ambitious clean energy economy goal of 100% carbon-free by 2050. And that's outlined in the state's first ever clean energy plan that was released last April. This plan included over 70 strategies that once implemented will lower energy bills for everyday Wisconsinites, reduce resilience of out-of-state uh, reliance, sorry, on out-of-state energy sources, invest in job and apprentice training, and creating more than 40,000 jobs by 2030 in the state of Wisconsin. So this is exciting. Um, there's a lot for us to be um, really motivated to work together in order to make things, these things happen. Um, so not only is evaluating the existing nuclear um, energy part of the clean energy portfolio, but so is exploring new nuclear energy opportunities. The governor's budget proposal would make these ambitious plans readily available once enacted. We're currently in the public hearing process of the budget here in the state of Wisconsin, and we know that there are a couple, one more public hearing and a lot of debate that's going to be happening by our Joint Finance Committee. Um, what it is that matters to you needs to be delivered to those folks. At this point, we're hearing that many of the governor's provisions are going to end up on the floor, but that doesn't mean that they can't be tucked back into the budget. And I implore you all to reach out and speak to your legislators about what your priorities are and how it is that they match up with what the governor has included. Because we all know that clean energy is good for the state of Wisconsin. It provides family-sustaining jobs, many of them union jobs. It improves our climate. 
um, and it helps keep costs low for consumers as they move forward. So I want to thank you all for sharing space with me today, for inviting me to be here, um, and for all it is that you do for our communities. I look forward to being able to have more conversations with you um, over the coming months. I appreciate your time. Thank you, Melissa, Senator Agard. It certainly is a busy time in the legislature right now, and I've always kind of thought that the budget was kind of a, a seven-act play. So we're in the beginning of that second act where it's been introduced, but we're now doing hearings, and that is important as we go through the summer and look for some bipartisan uh, solutions on some of the things that we would propose for the next uh, budget in Wisconsin. We're going to turn to our second legislative perspective, uh, Representative Peterson, has joined us this morning. He was born in Wapaka, Wisconsin, and raised his family there. He has represented the area of uh, in the State Assembly since 2006. He was elected Speaker Pro Tempore for the Assembly for the 2023-24 legislative session after serving as Assistant Majority Leader since 2021. Of note, Representative Peterson, he served in the U.S. Navy Submarine Service from 1983 to 94, and he is a Persian Gulf War veteran and served in the U.S. Naval Reserve uh, as a member from 1994 to 2008. Thank you for your service, Representative, and thank you for joining us today. Good morning, everyone. What an honor to be here today. Uh, yesterday, when I was getting ready to come down to Madison, uh, I talked to my wife and I said, I can't wait till Thursday morning. You know, it's, it's a power breakfast and we're going to talk nuclear energy all morning. Do you want to come along? And she looked at me and she said, no. <laughs> but she did give me a kiss goodbye as I left and she said, I hope your speech on nuclear power lights up the room. <laughs> okay, bad. So how did I get here? I'm looking at the, at, at the program today, and I'm looking at all these great speakers, and I'm like, why the heck am I on here? I mean, look at the qualifications of the other people speaking today. And I'm going to give you a little background of probably how I ended up here. So in 1983, I graduated high school and joined the United States Navy. And in 1984, I completed the Navy's Advanced Electronics course, Following by that, I completed their nuclear uh, energy course. And in 1984, I was qualified in the Navy as a reactor operator on board a nuclear submarine. And for those of you, reactor operator mainly is the person in charge of the core of the nuclear reactor. We are the ones that pull the rods that control the fission, and we are the ones that control all the electronics in the pumps that maintain the nuclear core. In 1986, the Navy put me through college, and in 1989, I graduated with a mechanical engineering degree out of the University of New Mexico. It wasn't a surprise that I picked New Mexico to get my degree. Nothing wrong with Wisconsin schooling, uh, but being in New Mexico, Los Alamos Labs, and many, many other great nuclear institutes to study under my mechanical engineering experience. In 1990, I graduated as an engineering watch officer on board the nuclear reactor. And in 1993, I was qualified through the Navy as an engineer of a nuclear reactor, which means you're the person in charge of everything involved with the nuclear. Um, so that's how I started there. But that's my background. Why are we here today? How did we get to this point, right? So I just got a couple of notes here. I don't read them verbatim, but I, there's a couple things I want to make sure gets put out. Currently, there's three sites located in Wisconsin for nuclear power. The La Crosse reactor in Genoa was permanently shut down in 1987. Kiwani's reactor was shut down in May of 2014, and Point Beach currently has two reactors that have operational licenses. So slowly, nuclear power has been decreasing, unfortunately, in the state of Wisconsin. If you go back to 1983, Act 401, known as Wisconsin's Nuclear Moratorium, was imposed. And according to analysis by the Nonpartisan Legislative Reference Bureau, under current law, with certain exceptions, a person may not construct any new power plant unless the Public Service Commission has issued a certificate to the person. 
To get that certificate under that old moratorium, two things had to be done. There had to be a facility with sufficient capacity to receive the spent fuel from the nuclear power plants in the states, and two, that construction of the power plant is economically advantageous to ratepayers based on specific factors. Let's think back a little bit. For us that are older in the room, 1983, can you believe that in the year 2023, we are now talking about something that was passed 40 years ago already? Wow, right? But if you look at that, some of that has become extinct and what they talked about it. Specifically, the provision of the Nuclear Waste Policy Act of 1982 required the federal government construct a national repository for a storage facility at Yucca Mountain in Nevada. Okay? Is Yucca Mountain open, Yucca Mountain open yet? Nope. Is it going to open? No, exactly. And this could be another whole side story, but we got a lot of other speakers. Someday we got to look into on all the money that Wisconsin, as having nuclear power, has sent to the federal government to build Yucca Mountain, and it has never come back to the state. Just a sidebar to think about later, right? But on March 3rd, 2010, the Department of Energy filed a motion with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to withdraw the license application for a high-level nuclear waste repository at Yucca Mountain with prejudice. President Obama's fiscal year 2011 budget eliminated funding for the Office of Civilian Reactive Waste Management. On August 26, 2014, the Obama Administration Nuclear Regulatory Commission, NRC, issued a final rule on continued spent nuclear fuel storage. The waste confidence decision was revised to the continuing storage of spent nuclear fuel rule. In other words, that rule now allowed cask storage on site of nuclear fuel. The continued storage rule adopts the findings of the generic environmental impact statement, GEIS, regarding the environmental impacts of storing spent fuel at reactor sites after the reactor's license period of operation. As a result, those generic impacts do not need to be reanalyzed in the environmental reviews for individual licenses. So what we now have is we have, at that time, statutes on the books that would forever stop nuclear power from being ever generated again in the state of Wisconsin or built because we have statutes on the books that no longer can ever be matched because there's no longer ever going to be a federal repository site. But let's think about this a little bit more. Right? We're talking about the storage of nuclear waste, right? And this is one of my favorite lines that I wrote when I was uh, doing what I'm going to talk about next. It is not nuclear waste unless we decide to waste it. The potential usable energy represented by spent fuel rods makes a compelling case for advanced nuclear energy technologies, which a lot of us here today are here to hear about. I authored AB 384, which became 2015 Act 344, which repeals the 1983 Act 401 nuclear moratorium. When we come to Madison, all of us have ideas of what we are set out to do, what we want to work in. And me, with my nuclear technology background, one of the biggest things I wanted to work with is to repeal that nuclear moratorium so that all energy sources could be looked at moving forward in the state of Wisconsin. AB 384 incorporated advanced nuclear energy options into the state energy policy using a reactor design or amended reactor design approved after December 31st, 2010 by the United States Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Advanced nuclear energy will be prioritized, and it is, between combustible renewable energy sources and non-renewable combustible energy sources in the state energy policy statute 1-2 for CM. And one of the things I learned as I was authoring that bill is sometimes in Madison we get hung up on is this bipartisan, this group's fighting here, this group's fighting there. The interesting part is after I authored that bill to repeal the nuclear moratorium, 
the bipartisanness of the people that came forward that wanted to help work on that. And uh, one of them was, and I don't know if he's here today, and I'm saying this in a good light, but his name was Frank Jamblowski. Anyone ever heard of him? Frank Jamblowski has the Progressive Law Group LLC in Madison. So think of me, a diehard conservative legislator out of Wisconsin, working with him in Madison. We probably would never, ever match anything in political views. But we're working together on repealing Wisconsin's nuclear moratorium. Along with him and other groups, I was working with Greenpeace, right? Okay, my first thing of Greenpeace was, the only time I had ever seen them is, you ever seen them in their little yellow uh, boats when they're going out painting yellow peace signs on nuclear submarines? My only dealing before them was ever blowing them off the side of the submarine with a fire hose so that they couldn't get on board the, the ship, right? But we're all working together, and that's what's so neat about this. We are working together with that. So what it turned out is the repeal of the nuclear moratorium passed in 2016 bipartisanly. It was a uh, voice vote in the Assembly and a roll call vote in the Senate, but it passed bipartisanly and it became law. And what I'd like to end up with today is one last final thought. We have the University of Madison, and we've all seen, now we have Miss America, who is studying nuclear power uh, to get a degree at the University of Madison. University of Madison gets millions of dollars and competes with powerhouses like MIT for the study of advanced nuclear energy. Isn't it outstanding that we've now repealed the nuclear moratorium, and we're sitting in this room today where we might not even have had this conversation if we couldn't be moving that forward. So I very much appreciate being here today, and I just uh, like the idea of sending the signal that Wisconsin is ready to expand its energy portfolio and reach the future. Thank you very much for your time today. Thank you, Representative Peterson, for that interesting perspective of kind of where we have been in the past, where we are going now, really this um, renaissance, uh, a new discussion of uh, nuclear moving forward. Um, I'm glad that you noted that the vote was uh, a voice vote in the assembly, so I was assured that I voted the correct way when I was serving in that body. Next, we have Cheryl Moss Herman, who I'm really excited. As I was visiting with her earlier and just... Again, the dynamic and uh, fantastic speakers that we have here this morning. And thank you so much, Cheryl, for agreeing to join us here today. We are delighted to welcome Cheryl Moss Herman to bring a federal perspective on policies that are impacting nuclear power. She, as you read in the, the um, biography, uh, she's a senior advisor to the Assistant Secretary in the Office of Nuclear Energy. And Cheryl's presentation will be about 20 minutes long, and we should have some time for Q&A afterwards. So if you have questions, please write them on the index tape uh, cards that are on your table uh, with your name and email address. And give them to Kristen, who will be wandering around the room to collect them. And we will follow up with emails for questions that we don't have time for here today. Uh, but as I said, Cheryl serves as the Senior Advisor to the Assistant Secretary in the Office of Nuclear Energy in the U.S. Department of Energy and has more than 30 years' experience in public policy issues affecting nuclear energy. So thank you so much. Welcome to Madison, and we're so glad that you'll have some other visits that you're doing here today as part of Department of Energy. Good morning, everybody. I always wonder with a podium whether it's going to be short enough that you can actually see me or that I end up doing like the queen did where it's just the hat. <laughs> so here I am. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Leader Agard, Speaker Pro Tempore Peterson, for your remarks. Thank you to Kristen. Thank you to the members of the Customers First Coalition for inviting me to be here today representing the Department of Energy's Office of Nuclear Energy and contributing to your dialogue about the role of nuclear energy in Wisconsin's energy mix. Now, the original invitation was actually to Dr. Katie Huff, who's the Assistant Secretary for Nuclear Energy, and she sends both her regrets and her best wishes for a productive dialogue today. As a Badger, I'm sure you know she would have been here if she could have been. 
Now, as I was preparing this talk, I was reflecting on the last time I was in Madison. It was a frigid winter day, maybe, I don't know, 85 degrees colder than it is today. And I was here with my then high school senior to attend the Admitted Students Day at the University of Wisconsin. And I have to tell you, for almost all of her senior year, she walked around the house like this, <laughs> thinking the W. And I remember back on that spring, lots of discussion about looking for the right fit for a college for her. What were the pros and cons of the school she was interested in? What were her goals for the future? How could she get a broad base of knowledge and keep her options open? We explored many dimensions of student life. How did she see herself spending her time? What were the options in her lifestyle that she was going to try to support? And then we factored cost into the discussion, but not exclusively so. It was more about fit. And although cost was a very, very, very important part of the discussion, it wasn't the sole part of the discussion. And I tell this story because in my reminiscing about being in Madison, it occurred to me that there were some similarities between the college selection process that many of us and our children have gone through and the process of looking at the role of nuclear energy and the energy fit for the state. It's about gaining the knowledge, understanding the options, having a clear vision of future goals, and then really finding that fit. So this morning I'm going to get an overview of nuclear energy activities at the Department of Energy. I'll discuss some important incentives that have been enacted into federal law in the last year. I'll share some of our goals regarding consent-based siting for spent nuclear fuel. I'd also like to talk about a recent somewhat thought-provoking report published by the department focusing on the liftoff to commercialization. And I'd like to share with you some of the engagements we have with states and encourage you to partake of these and these kinds of engagements to the extent you're seeking to expand your knowledge base. So my goal this morning is to share knowledge, provide food for thought in understanding your clean energy options as you strive to meet Wisconsin's energy and climate goals. And we heard from Senator Agard this morning how important that is. It's up to you to find that fit. And I trust that the discussion this morning will help you on that journey. We're definitely at a turning point, not just for the future of nuclear energy, but for our efforts to tackle the climate crisis and for meeting the escalating challenges to our energy security. The department's goal, and that of the administration, is to do everything possible that we can to get the United States powered by clean energy and use every single clean energy tool that we have available. Nuclear energy is essential to this strategy. It's the only way to reach our goals of 50% reduction in carbon emissions by the end of this decade, 100% clean electricity by 2035, and a net zero economy by 2050. So let's talk about what will take to get us there. Now importantly, the first step in growing is to stop shrinking. To meet these goals, we simply can't afford to lose our existing clean energy infrastructure. We heard about La Crosse and Kiwana here in Wisconsin. Today, there are more than 400 reactors globally, and 92 of those are in the United States, and two operating reactors are here in Wisconsin. U.S. nuclear reactors are the largest single source of carbon-free electricity on the grid today, and they support nearly a half million good-paying jobs. Here in Wisconsin, nuclear energy is by far the largest source of carbon-free electricity, and it supports about 600 good-paying jobs. And I'm sure you're aware these plants contribute millions in tax revenues that support local economies, infrastructure, and school systems. In many cases, they sustain communities, and losing a plant due to premature closure has a terrific impact on those communities. So we absolutely must find ways to keep those plants up and running. Now, 2022 was a big year in that regard. The bipartisan infrastructure law provided $6 billion for the Civil Nuclear Credit Program to keep existing reactors operating. And as you may know, the Department of Energy selected Diablo Canyon for a conditional award last fall. Along with the actions from the state of California, this will help keep two gigawatts of firm, clean power on the grid where it's needed. Beyond this, the 2022 Inflation Reduction Act also includes production tax credits for existing reactors. The Zero Emission Nuclear Power Credit, or 45U as it's known in the tax code or tax speak, is intended to support the continued operation of the existing fleet to achieve our decarbonization goals. 
And I'll try to walk through some of the known contours of this with you. The credit in the law is 1.5 cents per kilowatt hour, and that's tripled as long as certain prevailing wage conditions are met. The tripled production tax credit translates to $15 a megawatt hour as long as gross receipts do not exceed $25 a megawatt hour. Once you reach that $25 a megawatt hour, the tax credit goes down until gross receipts reach $43.75, and at that point the credit goes to zero. Now those are the raw numbers. These, these numbers are actually going to be inflation adjusted. The tax credits are being implemented by the Department of Treasury. There is some technical assistance provided by our office and across the Department of Energy. And I'm sure you have key questions about what constitutes gross, resource, uh, gross receipts and how that will be calculated for the purposes of the 45U credit, along with the desire to learn more about the prevailing wage conditions. I don't have the answers. Treasury is working on that. It's expected that there will be a notice of proposed rulemaking later this year and that the tax credit eligibility will begin January 1st, 2024, and continues through 2032. I'm hopeful that a combination of these economic incentives will increase the number of applications for reactor lifetime extensions and enable many of our U.S. reactors to contribute to 2050 goals. I note that the license uh, exploration for Point Beach is, is coming up soon, 2030, and I think it's 2033. So as you think about your future energy and environmental goals, consider this information in the question of your fit. Now, historically, light water reactors have provided base load electricity. Now, advanced reactors, including small modular reactors and micro reactors, will provide choices to communities that need a constant and reliable source of clean power. Many of these technologies can adjust their electricity output to match demand and compare with renewables to provide around-the-clock emissions-free electricity. They supply thermal and electric energy as both primary and backup power for remote communities, as well as critical infrastructure like hospitals and even university campuses. Advanced reactors can also decarbonize energy-intensive processes that rely on fossil fuels, including hydrogen production, desalination, district heating, petroleum refining, and fertilizer production. These types of energy-intensive industrial processes account for a significant portion of the environmental footprint and carbon emissions in the United States today. Advanced reactors could drastically reduce that environmental burden and bring our climate goals a little tiny bit closer to reality. On the hydrogen front, the department is already funding work at four existing plants, the Palo Verde plant in Arizona, the Davis-Bessey plant in Ohio, Nine Mile Point in New York, and Prairie Island in neighboring Minnesota. And this is how we can demonstrate that nuclear energy can be used to produce clean hydrogen. Simply put, our advanced reactors are going to expand the opportunities to deploy nuclear technology and provide benefits to communities that align with our diverse community needs and with our community uh, clean energy goals. So these are things you should consider as you think about your future goals and you continue to consider that fit. Small modular reactors are also the right size to replace aging and retiring fossil energy plants. Communities and developers can take advantage of uh, existing infrastructure our highly skilled workforce as they identify locations to deploy small modular reactors. The many skilled workers that would be at risk of losing their jobs when the coal plant retires are perfectly suited to the transition to employment at a nuclear power plant. Here in the United States, one-third of the coal fleet retired during the 2010s, and a quarter of the remaining capacity has announced plans to retire. Our carbon reduction goals also add pressure to accelerate the pace of these retirements. Repowering a coal station with nuclear provides economic opportunities to site owners and their surrounding communities. These transitions will bring tangible benefits to the energy communities beyond jobs. They'll bring new economic activities, reduce pollution, and improve environmental conditions more broadly. And now this is the plan for one of our Advanced Reactor Demonstration Program awardees, TerraPower. They'll build their natrium uh, demonstration reactor in Wyoming and help us decarbonize our energy sector while preserving energy jobs in their community. And beyond the reactor developer, the utility, which is Pacific Core, 
the state and local representatives are all working together to make this project a success. Indeed, Pacific Corps and TerraPower have signed a new memorandum of understanding, and they're trying to identify five, five new sites for additional natrium reactors to be deployed by 2035. That's really exciting. And as more coal plants retire, we're eager to pursue more of these kinds of projects so that we can bring every community along in our important clean energy transition. Again, this is something you should consider as you consider your goals and consider your fit. And I'd like to talk a little bit now about what the Office of Nuclear Energy is doing in the advanced reactor area, things that support deployment. The department is moving aggressively to support the deployment of advanced nuclear demonstration projects that provide for a first of a kind to prove advanced nuclear concepts. Secretary Granholm, our current Secretary of Energy, is known to say, deploy, deploy, deploy. And as we do our work, we always kind of hear that playing on loop in the background. The TerraPage, TerraPower Natrium Project, boy, that is a mouthful. The X Energy XC100 Project and the Carbon Free Power Project using new scales light water uh, based small modular reactor are three projects that NE is supporting to prove the commercial applications of advanced projects by the end of this decade. I should note that the new scale design is the first to receive design certification from the NRC. And if you ever go to trivia night, it's the seventh design certification ever issued by the NRC. So write that down. The department is also working aggressively to implement a domestic supply chain of high assay, low enriched uranium that's used by many of these advanced reactor designs uh, that could be constructed in the next decade. And these activities are funded through the Inflation Reduction Act. We also support deployment through capacity building in our university programs. These include competitively awarded university-led research and provides for both services and support for uni U.S. university research reactors, and there's one here in Madison. Yearly, university uh, solicitations support outstanding, cutting-edge, and innovative research at U.S. universities in the area of nuclear energy science, technology, and social impacts. Our programs help develop a workforce with hands-on experience and offer research capabilities that address emerging technical challenges. The University Nuclear Leadership Program, UNLP, provides undergraduate scholarships, graduate fellowships to students attending two- and four-year institutions and supports other internship programs that assist disadvantaged communities. Now, some of this research was mentioned by Representative Peterson, and I have to share that the University of Wisconsin-Madison has really done the state proud. It was awarded almost $2.9 million, $2 million in fiscal 22 to support four nuclear energy university program research and development projects plus a reactor upgrade grant. Over the years since 2009, the University of Wisconsin at Madison has received over $61 million in awards of different types. That's really phenomenal. And just last week, ENIA announced the uh, 2022 University Nuclear Leadership Program awardees, and a University of Wisconsin graduate student was awarded a fellowship of about $169,000. So extending my analogy a little bit, I'm going to go out on a limb here, and I'm saying I'm guessing that student found their fit. Now, there are additional incentives in the Inflation Reduction Act. The Inflation Reduction Act provides for technology-neutral clean energy production tax credit, known as the 45Y credit, a technology-neutral clean energy investment tax credit, known as the 48E tax credit, for new zero carbon electricity facilities, which includes nuclear plants. New nuclear generation put into, 20, put into service in 2025 or later is eligible for the 45Y production tax credit of at least $25 per megawatt hour for the first 10 years of operation. This credit is inflation adjusted and eligible for a 10% bonus for energy communities, which is defined as either brownfield or fossil uh, coal communities, and an additional 10% bonus for certain domestic content. New nuclear generation is also eligible for the 48E investment tax credit of 30%. Again, there's a 10% bonus for energy communities and an additional 10% bonus for certain domestic content. The investment tax credit phases out 
the later of 2032 or when the power sector emits 75% less carbon than 2022. All of these are aimed at, at reducing carbon and incentivizing clean energy development. Now, the kicker with these, these incentives is that the entities must choose to partake of one or the other, either the PTC or the ITC. You can't take both. So the best option will depend on the specific circumstances of the generation that's being brought into service. Now, as Representative Peterson noted, it's hard to talk about new nuclear power without addressing the question, but what about the waste? To realize the full potential of nuclear energy technology, we must begin to tackle the long-term management of the nation's spent fuel. DOE is working towards an integrated waste management system that will include one or more federal consolidated interim storage facilities, the transportation infrastructure that's needed to move that spent fuel and high-level waste, and then a pathway to permanent disposal. DOE is committed to using a consent-based process to site facilities for waste management. Consistent with our appropriations, DOE's current focus is on siting one or more federal consolidated interim storage facilities for commercial spent fuel. Federal interim storage will enable the removal of spent fuel from the nuclear plant sites and promote new jobs and economic opportunities for those host communities. Lessons learned from this effort can inform the future development of other facilities, eventually such as a deep geologic repository. The department is committed to this consent-based siting approach, and it's an approach that enables broad participation and centers both equity and environmental justice in the discussion. Consent-based siting meets the needs of the people and communities central and critical to that siting process. And this consent-based siting process is just by its nature, phased, adaptive, collaborative. There's time built into the process for mutual learning with the interested communities. Potential outcomes could include a consent-based agreement defined by the community in collaboration with our department. It could include a, determine that, a determination that after exploring the option, the community is just not interested, and both would be considered successful outcomes in this process. It's quite a challenge but we believe that consent-based siting is the right thing to do and really our best chance for success. There was a, a funding opportunity announcement last uh, earlier this year, and we're currently evaluating the proposals that we received. This was uh, announced in September 22, closed earlier in 2023, and with new funds that we received at the end of the year, we were able to make $26 million available. We expect later this year to make between six and 16 awards. And with this funding opportunity, I make it clear that DOE is not yet soliciting, I'm having trouble with that word today, soliciting volunteer sites. We are simply hoping to, to start a dialogue using that consent-based process and our goal is one or more federal consolidated interim storage facilities. Now I'd like to turn to something very recent, very thought-provoking, the department's Pathways to Commercial Liftoff Report for Advanced Nuclear. In late March, just a couple weeks ago, the department released the first three in a series of Pathway to Commercial Liftoff Reports that are intended to explore how and when technologies can reach full-scale deployment. The first three addressed are hydrogen, advanced nuclear, and long-duration energy storage. The reports are forward-leaning, and they're intended to engage the public and private sectors together towards the commercialization and deployment of clean energy technologies. They provide a perspective on how and when technologies could reach full commercial adoption. Importantly, they're intended to provide a common analytical fact base and call out some critical signposts that will be needed to get significant investment. They're intended to be thought-provoking and conversation-starting. And here's where, if I were you know, doing a slide presentation, I'd put up the really tiny print with the disclaimer. They don't reflect specific policy positions of the department or the intentions towards specific program execution or funding. They're intending to continue the dialogue and provide things for us all to consider together. And given the rapidly changing markets and evolving technologies, these reports are going to be living documents and talking with the staff that put these together. There may even be an update within this year on the advanced nuclear front. 
And regarding advanced nuclear, the report starts with the premise that it is widely regarded as a clean, firm power source that can reliably complement widespread renewable energy build-out. Let me repeat that as you consider fit. Can reliably complement widespread renewable energy build-out. And as I noted earlier, nuclear energy has additional use cases beyond the traditional generation of electricity. The report goes on to say that adoption of this technology has the potential to create long-term uh, long high-paying jobs. It can deliver new economic opportunities for traditional energy communities, particularly those that have pre-existing power generation infrastructure like coal communities. The report concludes that we'll need between 100 and 200 gigawatts of new nuclear by 2050 in order to meet our decarbonization goals. Keep in mind that an additional 200 gigawatts would more than triple our current nuclear generating capacity. Pretty ambitious goal. Nuclear has a tremendous opportunity to contribute, but the report notes that inertia needs to be overcome in a number of areas. Financing, supply chain, fuel supply, project management and construction, and also in regulatory spaces. A ramping up of the resource chain needs to start now. The report notes that there are three things, three areas that really we should focus on. First of all, a committed order book. We need to, uh, the report concludes we can't wait until the mid-2030s to begin to deploy. We need to get utilities to accelerate the order book with a goal of five to ten orders of the same design in the next couple of years. The report speculates that these orders will likely be based on Gen 3 plus light water designs first, and they stress the importance of learning from building one reactor to the next in order to reduce costs and time. The second area we need to focus on is project delivery. Deliver the project reasonably on time and on budget, and then the report defines on time and on budget as being within 20% of the target. We could talk about that. Take into account lessons learned, best practices, and advantage of standardization of that multiples of a kind kind of reactor. And indeed, the report bases many of its cost estimates on learning from building that multiple reactor. The third area is industrialization. And this has to do with ensuring that we have the workforce, the supply chain, the licensing capacity support. And it notes that historical cost and construction challenges are in part mitigated when you're talking about small modular reactors. In addition, they note that the last reactor to join the grid just earlier this month, the Vogel 3 reactor in Georgia, provides important lessons on rigorous pre-construction planning, things that we need to, to learn from. These lessons need to be actively incorporated into our new builds. The report puts forth different ways that we could consider mitigating risk, things like catalyzing the order book through federal offtake, things like risk insurance, and there's a whole bunch of other risk mitigation um, proposals that I would draw your attention to. There's a lot to talk about. I could probably spend another 45 minutes kind of walking through it. It takes, it takes a long time to go through it. And if you wish to repeat, read the report yourself in your, in your knowledge gaining, I would really strongly suggest that you do that. And I'll give you the website. It's liftoff, L-I-F-T-O-F-F, -F, one word, dot energy, dot gov. That's liftoff.energy.gov, and there you'll find the liftoff series, including the advanced re, uh, reactor. So now the subject of FIT, and I, I'll try to, try to wrap up quickly here, um, takes me to the subject of engagement and learning more. The Office of Nuclear Energy has partnerships with three national groups that focus on state energy policy, Things like, uh, groups like the National Governors Association, the Nuclear Legislative Working Group, which is currently managed by the National Conference of State Legislators, NCSL, and the National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissioners, or NARUC. Some current opportunities. NARUC is current, uh, excuse me, NCSL is currently renewing its membership on the Nuclear Legislative Working Group. My understanding is that members are nominated by the leadership in their legislatures and that we host a variety of both virtual and in-person learning opportunities, including a couple times a year, a chance to get together and see some nuclear sites and meet your fellow legislators face to face. Um, last year's working group, by the way, did not have a participation from Wisconsin. So if there's any interest, please reach out to me and I, I can make that connection for you. We also have a nuclear energy partnership with NARUC, 
and NARUC has partnered with the National Association of State Energy Officials, NASIO, to launch an advanced nuclear state collaborative that was just announced this week. And that collaborative will provide an opportunity for peer-to-peer -peer sharing, access to experts. We're going to meet both the regulators and the state energy officials where they're starting and help form a discussion tailored to their needs and their interests. And I'm really excited that there's uh, multiple participants from Wisconsin Public Service Commission that will be joining and participating in that. And I look forward to meeting some of you either here today or, or out in Richland in a couple of weeks when we do our kickoff. The state uh, group level engagements are really an excellent way to expand your knowledge base. And so if you have any questions about NGA and CSL, NARUC, any other alphabet soup, feel free to, to come in and, and uh, talk to me, and I'd be more than happy to make those connections. So now you've listened to, to my whole story here, and if you were listening earlier to my, the story of my daughter's college journey, you probably already guessed that my daughter did not choose the University of Wisconsin, because had she been a student here, I can assure you that I would have been to Madison at least once a hundred times in the last five years, and you probably would have seen me jumping around at Camp Randall at least once. So well, Wisconsin was the front runner for a matter of months in the process of asking questions about the different attributes of each college and educating herself. She realized that her long-term goal was to teach elementary school back in Maryland where we're from. But as a theater kid, her interest in Maryland was fueled in large measure by the invitation to join a University of Wisconsin performance group called the Wisconsin Singers. But as she learned more, the choice to join that group would have meant large trade-offs for her evenings, significant time from away from campus on the weekends, uh, touring the state. She talked to a lot of people. She asked a lot of questions, but ultimately she made her choice based on fit. So her W became an M, and she graduated from the University of Maryland, and she is now performing each and every day for the 10-year-olds in her fifth grade class in Maryland. So I note that folks that are here today come from different backgrounds, both public and private. And like my daughter's views about colleges, and the University of uh, Wisconsin in particular, you may already have a going in position on nuclear energy or not. Representative Peterson talked about his going in position coming from the nuclear Navy. But I encourage you to take time this morning, ask questions about clean energy options, and learn why I think nuclear energy should be continued to be part of the state's clean energy mix. Senator Agard mentioned weighing in with the legislation, uh, legislature as they consider the budget options. I think that's a great idea. I trust that as you go forward, you hone your vision of where you see Wisconsin's energy and environmental goals uh, taking you. You'll keep learning and you will find that fit. If the Office of Nuclear Energy can help, please don't hesitate to reach out. And I thank you for listening. question that uh, was submitted to Kristen, and it says, with the Russians leaving the treaties with the USA, do we have an opportunity to start reprocessing spent fuel? The Russians' uh, unprovoked war on Ukraine poses a lot of energy security challenges globally. And one of those challenges is looking at fuel supply. Something I didn't talk about was the department looking at developing a uranium strategy in order to ensure that we have uh, a, a secure, reliable economic supply of fuel, both for the current fleet and for our future fleet. With respect to the reprocessing, the department does an enormous amount of research and development on the technical aspects of reusing spent fuel uh, in the reprocessing area. There is no commercial reprocessing now, but we do support the research and development so that when it is timely and economic, we're ready to jump into the fray. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. A round of applause for Cheryl. and, and 
A lot of information there, and I know during the 15-minute networking, I've got some follow-up questions that I wanted to ask you, too. The exciting news of the fusion breakthrough and workforce issues as we move forward, so thank you very much. Next, we are going to turn to Christine Chismadea. Christine is the Senior Director for State Governmental Affairs and Advocacy at the Nuclear Energy Institute and has been with NEI for 16 years developing and managing state, local, and grassroots programs. Christine manages NEI's advocacy arm, known as Nuclear Matters, a coalition that seeks to inform and educate policy makers and the public on the value of nuclear energy. Welcome, Christine, and we are, uh, we'll follow the same procedure for questions. Uh, and after questions for Christine, we'll take a quick networking break, followed by our outstanding industry panel. Please welcome Christine. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, uh, thanks to Kristen and, and the coalition, and a special thanks to um, Dairyland and Paul Wilson uh, for suggesting uh, any IBA speaker today. We have uh, a lot going on and a lot to share. Um, special thanks also to leaders Agard and, and Peterson, and I would be remiss if I didn't also thank Frank uh, Jablonski for all the work getting us here. Um, and repealing the moratorium. So now we have the opportunity to actually talk about nuclear. Um, in case folks don't know, NEI is uh, the National Trade Association. Uh, we represent the utilities that operate the nuclear power plants, but also the supply chain. And a growing part of our membership are all of the new designers for advanced nuclear, which is really what's put us in the position that we are today. So just a lot to unpack um, with our growing membership. If you want to flip to the first slide. Thanks, Kristen. So I did want to take a step back a little bit um, and give you guys a little bit of the context of why where we are now is so critical and so important uh, and so different from where we've been in, in past years. Uh, so for a very long time, the industry was really in a defense position. Uh, we've been defending the plants. Uh, the policy vehicles that we've been looking for at the states were taking a lot of the models of ZEX, zero emission credit programs, very similar to the REC programs. Uh, we were successful in defending plants and preserving the fleet in states like New York and Illinois. Uh, and these were pretty critical, um, and they were singular fights. Uh, there was only one fight really happening at a time, so it wasn't like a, a huge um, trend that was happening across the country. It was uh, very individual to states. Um, and so we were very successful in getting these ZEX passed. Uh, they're all on different clocks. They have three years, five-year renewal process. New Jersey just renewed their, uh, renewed their ZEC program. Other programs like the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, if folks aren't familiar with it, um, it's another program that looks at uh, recognizing nuclear for being zero carbon. And so programs like that were what we were trying to accomplish, what we were trying to push states to look look at and consider. Um, other programs like um, uh, what Cheryl mentioned, the Civil Nuclear Credit Program, I'm, my jaw is still off being picked off the ground of California saving their nuclear power plant, just something we did not see coming. Um, but the fact that they passed a $1.4 billion um, uh, loan and then it's to be forgiven by the Civil Nuclear Credit Program is part of the bigger package, part of the bigger recognition from states that they were recognizing their nuclear assets and they were looking to proactively preserve their existing fleet. Just something that we weren't necessarily seeing previously. We just weren't seeing any recognition. Nuclear was never mentioned in policy. It was never even, um, it was alluded to many times, but it, the fact that nuclear is proactively getting recognized and, and um, put into policies, which is something that was very different. So if you flip to the next slide... So what happened last year was monumental. Uh, we've never had this happen before. Like I said before, the bills that were being passed previously, they were singular. It was one bill a year, one bill that said the word nuclear in, in a year. Uh, I've been with NEI for 16 years, um, and so I've never seen this volume of policies being introduced, especially at the state level. And the federal is very successful as well. Um, but the idea that 19 states introduced legislation last year just to recognize nuclear and to incentivize new nuclear never happened before. Um, we've never seen that, that insatiable hunger from state policymakers. Um, and we could probably uh, break down, I think, a lot of the, the reasoning why we were seeing it. Some states were looking at how they're going to accomplish their clean energy goals. Some states were looking at just learning about the technology. But the idea that we had 19 states even interested in nuclear was just something historic that we've never seen before. And then, actually, 11 states took action that, again... <laughs> 
it's just I laugh because I've just never had so many hearings on nuclear energy in 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 history. Um, and the states that were actually looking at these bills. They're giving them hearings. They're passing votes, passing through committee. We never had such bipartisan support. Um, and these were all policies that were looking at new nuclear. Uh, and the trends that we saw last year really were, uh, were on things like SMR studies. So SMRs are the small modular reactors. Um, there's a number of states like a Montana and a West Virginia they don't have existing assets in nuclear. Uh, there's a lot to learn. You all are very uh, lucky that you have nuclear assets in your states. You already have the regulatory infrastructure, but the idea that these states need to learn about the technologies, need to understand how to speak to their constituents about the technology, um, that was kind of a new trend uh, that we saw these past this past year. Um, removing barriers, things like in Alaska, uh, they essentially had a, a protocol that they had to go through the legislature to, to cite new nuclear. So they changed it to uh, to the boroughs. Um, so essentially, it adjusted the barriers. But the idea was that they were trying to enable a project uh, in the state of Alaska. Um, and then, of course, the moratorium repeals, which salute to you all. You were the first ones. I mean, I, I think you get a round of applause for that. <laughs> You're certainly the first ones in the country to repeal your moratorium uh, years ago. Uh, and so last year, we saw... West Virginia and then Connecticut was a partial repeal. Um, so it wasn't a, a full repeal, but uh, over the years we've seen the Wisconsin, Kentucky, Montana, um, and then last year West Virginia and Connecticut. So that's a total of five states that have repealed moratoriums. Incredible. Uh, we've just never seen, again, that kind, of, that kind of momentum. So if you flip to the next slide. So this is a slide that I use um, to demonstrate where the conversations about nuclear are happening across the country. As you can see, two-thirds of the country are currently talking about nuclear policies. Um, and these are all state policies that have been introduced or, or passed. You're green because uh, you passed the moratorium repeal. Um, but you've also got states that are looking at these studies, states like Alaska that are removing, removing barriers. Uh, you've got states that are looking at um, uh, tax incentives, like Nebraska has a tax incentive program that they adjusted to allow for nuclear projects. Um, but these states are all where they have current conversations about nuclear policies that are specific to advanced nuclear. Um, so some of them do have existing assets, but they're looking at, at new deployment as well. If you go to the next slide... So this is kind of where the, um, the meat and potatoes of a lot of this work is, is happening. Um, and so what are the actual bills that are being introduced? What are these states actually talking about? Um, so I said that, you know, previously there was maybe one bill a year, uh, and it's significantly increased. Uh, this past year was over 100. This year we're actually hitting 200 bills. Um, and so as a state legislator, a lot of you are, Maybe 200 is not a lot of bills for you because I know you have to look at thousands of policies. Um, but the idea that there are 200 bills out there looking at, at uh, impacting nuclear is just pretty significant in terms of, of the policies. And what are, what are the states that are actually considering these bills? You have the moratorium repeals uh, in California. Oregon, Minnesota, and Illinois. Unfortunately, California just voted down their moratorium repeal earlier this week. Illinois is the only one that's actually moving. They've got some decent momentum. It's passed through the Senate, being considered in the House, but there's still a lot of work to be done. But the idea is that there still is continued momentum on those moratorium repeals. Probably the most significant trend really is around clean energy standards. Um, some of these states have versions of RPSs, Renewable Portfolio Standards, that were pressure points for the industry years ago and, and causing them to look at these uh, potential closures prematurely because they were unfavorable to uh, zero carbon emitters like nuclear. Um, but the idea of converting an RPS into a CES, so a renewable port so portfolio standard into a clean energy standard, is really the, the larger trend that we're seeing in terms of, okay, the first goal of an RPS was to deploy new technology. They were very successful, very good at doing that. But what's the new goal? The new goal is decarbonization and reaching clean energy goals. And how do you get there? You can't get there without nuclear. So the significant trend in, in adding nuclear to clean energy standards is probably the, the, most, um, the most prominent that we've seen this year. Already Minnesota, your neighbors, and, um, and uh, Idaho have also enacted uh, policies that 
include nuclear as explicitly uh, and make sure that nuclear is included in, in reaching their clean energy goal. Tennessee is the other one um, that uh, that is considering a similar one. You've got more SMR policies, SMR study policies in South Dakota and North Dakota. Both passed their SMR study bills already this year. Um, other versions of SMR studies in Oklahoma, New York, Maine, and Texas. Uh, task forces where they're looking at convening state policymakers to talk and learn about nuclear. Um, this is another great model that we encourage uh, states to look at. We just want to create forums where state policymakers can learn about the technology. Again, gain the language so that you can bring it back to your constituents and explain it to them. Uh, Nebraska and Connecticut are two task force uh, state bills. And then another big trend that we're seeing this year is workforce development. Um, we're seeing that, you know, we're in a war on talent, and, and that's not unique to nuclear. I think every industry really needs to make sure that they have a pipeline. Um, and so the fact that states are proactively trying to uh, make sure there's a funding stream for academic institutions like uh, the great ones that you have in Wisconsin, um, but just making sure that states have uh, the funding streams to make sure that the, the students have uh, the programs in place and the right curriculum to, to staff up these new advanced nuclear nuclear plants um, is probably one of the most encouraging trends that we see. Uh, workforce bills are in play in Washington, Nebraska, Virginia, uh, West Virginia, and South Carolina. Um, so we're very encouraged to see that. Um, I would say the the one trend that is significant, and I'll, I'll rattle off this list uh, if it means anything to, to folks, but the fact that the, the word advanced nuclear or new nuclear is mentioned in state policies um, this year in this this list of, of states is pretty significant. So you've got Washington, West Virginia, Virginia, Indiana, Minnesota, New York, Oklahoma, Connecticut, South Dakota, Illinois, Oregon, Maine, Nebraska, Missouri, California, Texas, North Dakota, and Florida. So that's that's a lot of the country talking about advanced nuclear. Um, and so that's really the critical point that we're at right now is that everybody wants to learn, everybody wants to be a part of it, and to enable policies that will help this new technology. So if you flip to the next slide, this is where uh, we're really doing a lot of our work these days. If you look in your white folders, um, I gave to Kristen uh, our newest resource is called Policy Options for States uh, to Support New Nuclear. Um, and so this is just meant to be a list of inspiration. Uh, and frankly, we hope that we can continue this conversation and, and NEI is here to help uh, in terms of, you know, whatever you would like to see deployed and whatever you would like to see um, introduced in, into Wisconsin. But the idea here is that some states were looking at other states and copying the SMR studies, and, and you've got other moratorium repeals that were happening. Some states don't have a moratorium to repeal. So we're getting asked constantly, what else can we do to help nuclear? What else can we do to help support new nuclear deployment? Um, and so we created this list of, of ideas, essentially. It's just policy ideas. Um, there are some examples of, of uh, that we can point you to that are pretty good um, and some legislative language that's, that's pretty good. For example, in Virginia, they have created a, a consortium. It's called the Virginia Nuclear Energy Consortium. Um, but this is, again, a forum for state policymakers, public and private stakeholders to get together to learn about nuclear and to make sure that there's um, a pathway forward for nuclear deployment. So I give that to you as an example of, of some of the, the legislative um, examples that we can give to you. And if you jump to the next slide, I won't go too deep into this because um, Cheryl covered it, and I'm, I'm glad you did, Cheryl. <laughs> um, so the, the state options are really uh, a good example of, of what we would like to see and, and what we're really pushing. Um, but there's a lot of federal incentives out there, um, and I think that that's pretty fair, uh, a f you know, a fair consideration. Um, the production tax credit mainly focused on the existing fleet um, and versus the investment task, tax credit where you have a 10-year um, sunset. Uh, you've got 30% uh, investment back once you actually deploy. Couple that with the 10% off um, for the energy transition community and the 10% for, uh, for the U.S. materials. That's 50%. That's a half off. So nuclear's on sale. So you might as well buy one. <laughs> 
<laughs> right? And then plus you've got the CHIPS Act, which is just terrific for all the academic institutions and, and the local communities that are looking at some of these transition projects. So um, just a lot of money on the table and a lot of options. Um, and Cheryl can unlock a lot of that for you. Uh, NEI is happy to, to be supportive if, if folks want to, to learn more about that. Um, and then finally, I will jump to the last slide. So I, I uh, in my introduction, uh, was mentioned that I, I run the, the advocacy program, Nuclear Matters. Please join our movement. Um, this is our grassroots organization. Uh, you won't receive anything more than emails from us, but um, this is a great way for you all to join and to, to get up to speed and, and to stay up to speed with all of the activities that are happening across the country and in your backyard. Um, so hope that you will, you will join the movement. Thanks, Kristen. Christine at all? He asked if um, she could explain a little bit more about the 12 different designs that are being um, explored. Um, you should have a whole other session on that, um, <laughs> a whole other day, a week, uh, and I'm happy to introduce you to all those companies. You know, a lot of the designs are different in terms of um, the coolants happen to be different. Um, and some models, like there's a company called Oaklo that's looking at recycling their fuel, so they, they use the same fuel that they originally use. Um, so they're all a little bit different, um, but they and they all have different generation um, um, designs in terms of some are very small, like the micro one to 10 megawatts versus the, the small reactors are up to 300 megawatts. Um, so it just varies depending on what the designs are. Thank you to all of our listeners for tuning in. Please support our work. You can subscribe to the Electric Wire podcast if you haven't already, and you can follow us on Twitter at The Electric Wire. Thanks also to the members of the Customers First Coalition for supporting this podcast. Our members are Dairyland Power Cooperative, Madison Gas and Electric, the Municipal Electric Utilities of Wisconsin, WPPI Energy, the Citizens Utility Board, the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, Local 2150, and the Wisconsin Electric Cooperatives Association. Thanks again for listening. We'll have a new episode next month.